Welcome to China in Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. In today's special episode, we sat down with Oliver Gale, co-founder and CEO of Panther Protocol, and Bonnie Glazer, director of the Asia program at the German Marshall Fund of the United States. They touch on the bombshell report that TikTok can access full user data, bypassing Apple and Google protections, how TikTok plays into the Ukraine-Russia tensions, and what that means for China and Taiwan. Let's dive in. Oliver, thank you so much for joining us today. Great to have you on the show. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. So let's begin with that bombshell report that says TikTok can circumvent Apple and Google's privacy protections and access full user data. So how is TikTok able to do that? Well, TikTok runs a web app which is nested within Android. And, you know, the truth of the matter is, is that it's not just TikTok that's able to look into our devices from an application perspective. TikTok is invasive, but I would also say that Facebook's invasive and Twitter is invasive. And so uh, the wider issue, so whilst TikTok is the focus, you know, it's a massively uh, popular and fast growing social media app. This is a wider phenomenon that we're all part of. So what are the risks then to the user? Well, it depends on how you look at it. You know, the fundamental risks are that your data is being extracted, you're being monitored. And again, like when I look at this problem, I don't look at it from the perspective of, oh, this is a TikTok issue. This is, uh, we have hundreds of applications sitting on our mobile devices, which have access to our cameras, to our metadata, to our microphones, and they're using those things to target us primarily with advertising and offers. But there's so much data which is being collected on each of us that it really undermines our freedom and sovereignty because the fact of the matter is we all live in a surveillance economy. Uh, and some very large corporations make tremendous amounts of money off of the back of that. And so you know, that's the consideration that we need to take into mind is like not necessarily one item of news, but Web 2, which is the Internet as we know it, the world of connected devices, fundamentally collects our data and uses it sometimes with our permission, other times without our permission. And that's what we need to be concerned about in that context. So what would be some ways of making these platforms safe and secure? Is it regulation? Is it government oversight? How can that be done? Yeah, it's a good question. It's definitely, there's two sides to it. One side is regulation. And regulation usually comes about in response to technology. And it also comes about in response to what people want. So there's education and awareness of, of, uh, of voters so that they can express their preferences. And then on the other side, there's the driver of regulation, which is technology. And we have this emerging internet called Web3, which is based on the idea that you can own your data, you can control your data, you can own your funds. Uh, and essentially it's a decentralized blockchain-based internet structure. So social media does not have to be owned by tech giants. Netflix does not have to be the owner of streaming content platforms. Uh, it, 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 banks do not have to be the ones with exclusive domain to provide financial services and so on and so forth. So we already, this Web3 economy is already emerging and in it, it allows individuals and communities to come together, govern, control and decide what they do with their money where they store it, how they store their identity. They have a sovereign identity, how they store their data and how they give other parties access to their data and ultimately uh, engage in the, the game of trade where it's like, hey, you want access to my data? Pay me. Um, so, you know, that's a major, I mean, blockchain's growing faster than the internet was at the same time in its life cycle. It is the fastest growing network and arguably the most important since the invention of the personal computer. So that is going to and is driving regulation. So now it's important that we express, hey, when you're writing these laws, make sure that I have sovereignty over my information and data. And 
You know, I think I think the beautiful thing about where we are is that technology it comes out like Pandora's box. You can't put the genie back in the bottle. So where we are, it's necessary that we evolve. Regulation evolves, commerce evolves, data ownership evolves. And we're beginning to see that. And so I think um, we're, we're at a very important moment in history where this either goes down as the moment where we, we lost it all and we, uh, we sunk into this dystopian world in which every street corner monitors us and every action we take is not one um, um, that is truly free. Or it's the moment in history where we say technology enables greater degrees of freedom and sovereignty and we can make a safer, more protected world where my rights are not extracted by, you know, um, the surveillance economy, right? And so that's the issue. That's where we're at. And so speaking of evolving, say, evolving technologies and Web2, it seems now social media has really changed the way people get their information. So for instance, right now there's that Russia-Ukraine border situation happening. And a lot of the videos people are getting are from TikTok. It's just users posting, saying tanks rolling down the streets. And there's an article by Axios that points out back in the way, back in the day, the world had access to this type of information either from the government or media but now with platforms like TikTok it's really changed that so how do you see TikTok and other platforms playing a role how do you see that going forward well right now I think it's a fantastic it, it's there are two sides to this coin there's the light side and there's the dark side of it uh, so the great thing about social media platforms and the power of our smartphones and having cameras and all of the wonderful tools that we have access to through our, our smartphones, which is greatly empowering for people, is that we can actually be the ones to report on what takes place, what really happens. So if tanks are rolling through your neighborhood and you have a smartphone and an internet connection, you can say, look, regardless of what the media communicates to me, that happened and here's evidence of it. I think that's usually empowering and it makes, you know, it makes for a better society because we want to be making our decisions based upon what's taking place. We don't want to be fed the propaganda campaigns which uh, represent the interest of one group or another. All decisions should be made on the basis of the facts. And so that's, that's the wonderful power of smartphones and platforms like TikTok um, that allow us to uh, see what's happening in the world. The other side to the coin is that this is a system and these systems can also be manipulated. And so you can have the same disinformation campaigns spread through a platform like TikTok. And if we go back to the US elections and the allegations that Russia was uh, influencing election outcomes through things like Twitter and uh, skewing social sentiment, these things are real, they're studied um, Cambridge Analytica was another example of it. So it is possible to use these platforms and create like a, a bubble of perception that isn't reality. And that comes back to the fundamental Web 2 problem, which is that TikTok is also a data collection machine that has a lot of user data and is also subject to political will. It's subject to uh, to essentially censorship. And so what we need is a decentralized social media platform, one where it has stronger governance and it's not so easily manipulated, one where you as an individual become the news reporter and you gain credibility for honestly reporting. And your peers can say, actually, you know, there was no tank that came through my neighborhood this morning. That's that was a uh, that was special effects, um, or that was some Photoshop or whatever it is, right? And so when you have that type of self-correcting network, that's where, and and to be honest, 
I've thought about this because honest media, honest, if you have good data, you can make good decisions. Web3 is going to facilitate this type of decentralized news network. Um, it hasn't been done yet, but it will be done. And then the question becomes at the fundamental layer of Web3, all of this data that you own, how do you store it? How do you transmit it? And it's important that you have privacy infrastructure in order to do that. In other words, if I own my identity, it should be private unless I want to share it. If I own my data, it should be private unless I want to share it. When I share it, it should be private. If I go and purchase something at the supermarket or the pharmacist, that should be private unless I want to share it. And so that's what, you know, that privacy aspect of Web3 is what our team at Panther has been focused on. Um, so that's, you know, that's our piece of the puzzle of assembling a better, uh, a better Web3, a better internet. Well, Oliver, thank you so much for joining us today. Great to have you on the show. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure.